What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of She, Her, They with Kittens. I'm Kittens, and this is a show where I highlight people who transcend identity expectations. Season one has been amazing. There's a bunch of episodes up, too. If you haven't watched those yet, go check them out. But a bunch of you guys had really, really awesome questions, so I figured I would do a little She, Her, Me episode and answer this for you. Before we get into it, though, make sure you like, subscribe and like and do the notification thing and I don't really know what other buttons there are to push, but like go push those too. And just a quick background on me in case you have no idea who I am and somehow stumbled here and are just a complete internet stranger. Hello, welcome. My name is Lauren Abedini. I go by Kittens. I'm a DJ, music producer, and just a human who likes to find new ways to empower people and make them feel like okay being themselves. And I happen to be a half Persian lesbian who likes cats, so... I got a bunch of questions about she, her, they and the whole like show process. And then also some personal ones about me, which I always feel really weird answering those. And also just talking to a camera is kind of awkward, not having anyone else in the room, but we're just going to roll with it. So um, let's just body slam right into this, shall we? First question is, why did you decide to make slash produce this whole show by yourself without a network, without any help? There's a few answers to this question. So number one, um, I thought of doing this when we were in the middle of like scary, crazy first time COVID lockdown. And, you know, I tour as a DJ and I that's been my life for the last decade. So um, feeling like that might never happen again and not knowing what was going on in the world, being completely uncertain and like terrified and also just all the social unrest and social injustices and awful depressing stuff that was happening with COVID. It was just a lot. And so partially I needed a good distraction and um, I am a tech nerd. So I was like, let me just throw myself into learning a completely new program, which I've never done before, which was Premiere. Shout out to Adobe. It's very complicated. Um, So yeah, I was like, let me learn how to do this. And then let me just pour all my time and energy into making a show by myself. So thankfully, my girlfriend's a graphic designer and she was able to whip up all the little graphic things that I needed. But when it came to producing, recording, editing, building all the things, that was me. Um, So yeah, it was mainly like the distraction thing, but then also... I thought it was really important to make sure that this turned out the way I really wanted it to. This is like a really kind of niche subject, I feel like. And I knew going with a network, which I spoke to a couple, going with a network, there's a bunch of people who have a say in what you make, how you make it, what it looks like, what it sounds like, the questions you ask, the kind of guests you have, all these things. Like, I didn't want someone to be able to tell me what to do. And I didn't want to have to worry about like, this not being appropriate for an advertiser or you have to release this during pride. Like that was a huge thing. I wanted these types of conversations to happen year round, not just during pride month or just during women's month. Like so annoying for those things to just be jam packed into one month. And then 11 other months out of the year, no one gives a shit. Like no one's talking about this. No, no, we need, we need a year round platform. So that's why I decided to do it by myself. And also, I'm just kind of a psycho control freak. So I was just like, perfect. This is a whole thing that I can do from start to finish, make myself go insane doing it, but it'll satisfy some weird need in me. Someone asked what the hardest part about making or starting the podcast was. Honestly, there were two things, but all of it had to do with tech stuff. I really thought I could just call my friends on Zoom and just download the Zoom file and that I'd be good to go. Wrong, (laughs) very wrong. The audio came out so bad. It was, I mean, if you go listen, like some of the audio is really questionable and the video quality is like not good. So I spent a lot of time after I had these conversations trying to do audio repair, audio cleanup, video, you know, finessing to make things sound and look better than they did because it was not up to my standards, but I wasn't going to be like, Hey guys, you want to have these conversations again? I didn't know. So, um, doing that 
was really hard. Like it was really tedious to do audio cleanup. Like things sounded grainy and like reverby and just kind of a mess. Um, so that was making me go insane. And then I couldn't trust my ears. I'm like, does this sound better? Or does it sound worse? I don't know what I'm doing anymore. And then aside from that, um, learning a whole new program, Premiere is complicated. But it's also very similar to music production programs, like the layouts and certain functionality. Um, But it was, I was learning a whole new thing that was something people make entire careers dedicated to. So that was hard. Um, Shout out to all my friends who, new internet friends and just like people in my life who um, guided me through some of those difficulties. What would you have done differently looking back at season one? So definitely I would have asked people for help in the beginning and gotten advice on audio and video recording for sure um, because cleaning that up after is a nightmare. But I would have also probably made some more custom tailored questions to each person I was interviewing because at first I thought, oh, cool, let's just have these same questions that you ask everyone, which is interesting And I really did love hearing everyone's different answers to the questions. But I also would have liked to know some specific things about each person that are a bit different and more unique. What will season two look like? So I'm not even sure I'm going to do like a season situation anymore because then you have to like make a bunch of stuff at once and put it all together in a package and then put it out. And like, I'm impatient and... I'm also very critical. So if I have a lot of time to mess with something and keep working on it and keep editing it, I will use that time and I will keep pushing the deadline. So I need to just kind of have, I think, a schedule. And also I want to have conversations kind of in real time and share those in real time instead of having months and months in between the recording time and sharing. Also for season two, I'm really going to expand the types of people that I have on the show. If you watch season one, which go watch it if you haven't, um, you know all of the guests are queer women, femme, and non-binary musicians, artists, recording artists. And uh, that's always going to be a priority for me. But I also, I really want to have people who are maybe in different industries, whether they're creative or business or, you know, sciences. I don't know, just people doing cool shit in non-traditional industries who have marginalized identity factors, whether it's their gender, their race, their sexual orientation, any part of their identity that kind of makes society go like, oh, you can't do that and holds them back in a way. I want to hear those stories. I want you guys to hear those stories. I want to really amplify and share those journeys because I feel like that kind of stuff will help to hear if you're some kid in a small town that hasn't seen anyone that looks like you doing what you want to do. And I feel like that representation is so important and gives people the inspiration to go after their dreams and like feel okay being who they are and doing what they want to do and liking what they want to like and whatnot. How did you choose people for guests? I honestly just was like, who is on this she, her, they playlist, which If you haven't checked that out, also plugging the playlist, but I literally was just like, who are my homies that are on this list that I can text and be like, hey, do you want to get on this show and just like chat with me for an hour? So I literally just texted my friends and asked them. Another person asked, would you have fans on the show? And honestly, I think that's such a good idea because we always hear great stories from people who are known or public facing or celebrities or famous in some way or whatever. And I think the people who are living normal, regular lives have the most incredible stories because it's so much harder to be unapologetic and open about who you are and chase your dreams when you don't have 90 billion fans saying, yeah, you're great. Go do this. You know, like, When you don't have the privilege of a fan base, of a bunch of followers, of money, of media, of whatever support systems, daring to live your life authentically without all of that, without that encouragement built in, is 
so brave and so interesting. And I think those stories deserve to be heard. And I think they're so important. So I would love to have some people on the show who are fans of it. I don't know how I'm going to pick or how we'll go about it, but like 1000% would love to do like a fan episode every so often. Favorite part of the show. Honestly, I think my favorite part has been people's responses because my God, like I literally was just like, let me do this as a passion project to distract myself and feel fulfilled and have some fun and learn something new. Like this was all just a side thing. And I was like, you know, if somebody gets help from this or someone feels seen and heard and like it helps their self-worth a bit, then beautiful, fantastic. There have been so many amazing messages and comments and DMs and all that that are just people being like, I feel validated. I don't feel alone. This makes me feel okay to be me, you know, thanking me and all this stuff. And I'm just like, whoa, there's so much out there as far as like representation in a lot of ways that I almost felt like, eh, I don't know if, you know, people will care about this or maybe this won't make a difference for anybody, whatever, but I just made myself do it. And just hearing people's messages validated me and this whole project and made me feel like all the energy and frustrating nights on my computer that I put in were totally worth it. And the community that's being built around it is just so incredible. And I'm just so grateful for it all. And it's also made me feel like a bit of purpose too, because yeah, I have stuff to do, but this feels like it's making a difference for some people. And that's more valuable to me than anything. Another favorite part of the show though, was asking everybody their, um, their ideal creation zone. Like I asked everybody the same question and asked them to describe what their ideal creation zone would be with no limitations, like science or anything. You could literally be like in the ocean on the moon, whatever. And everybody had such unique, interesting responses. Like some people wanted to be on the moon, like Demi wanted to be on the moon with a concert on the moon and only women there. And then Lauren Haregi wanted to be on a cloud that had like some oceans and like, I don't know, there's all these cool things going on. And I think Sid wanted a room that the walls changed and there's snacks. Like I forget, everybody had something really, really different. So it was fun to hear what space people would make for themselves to feel most free and most inspired creatively. Because I feel like nobody really talks about that enough. What was the most interesting thing about this podcast slash show, whatever experience, um, really just hearing the similarities and differences between people's life experiences was really cool. Because you forget sometimes, like some people maybe are like totally free and open and authentically themselves, but you don't always remember to look at the obstacles that they faced to get there and the hurdles they overcame and the personal struggles that they had. So hearing the struggles they did have or didn't have specifically, or when they realized who they were, all those things are just, I don't know. It's just so interesting to me. It like never loses its spark. All right. Now that we got through like the show questions and all that, I guess it's time to do um, the questions that were for me as a person, which is kind of, I don't know why it feels weird for me to like do this, but I guess this is what we do here. So I'll just get over it. But, um, so somebody asked, how did you come out? And if you have no idea who I am and you just somehow found your way here, my name is Lauren. I am an out lesbian. I came out when I was 15 years old. So it's been a very, very long time. And I, um, half Iranian. My mother is American. My dad's from Iran. So straight up immigrant conservative Muslim. But yeah, so coming out for me was an interesting experience because I had no idea, no idea whatsoever that I was gay before I met my first girlfriend. And um, once I met her, I was like, oh, that's why I wasn't into boys the way all my friends were. That's why I've always felt awkward and different and like I didn't fit in and like I didn't understand and that people didn't understand me. It was like a big light bulb moment, but I didn't know... um, I didn't even think about coming out. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm just like freaking out, understanding who I am first. And before I even had to get to this, the part where you think about, oh my gosh, I need to come out. My mom found out because my girlfriend had showed up at my house when I was really sick. I was sick on Valentine's day and she showed up with flowers and candy. And 
my mom, I went outside to get it from her car and my mom was like, Lauren, that's not just your friend, is it? And I broke down crying and I was like, I love her. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm gay. And she was like, it's cool. So my mom was really, really chill. Um, my dad found out because of the internet, of course, I thought posting pictures with my girlfriend on MySpace at the time was no big deal. And, um, he came across it. I actually don't remember how he was probably lurking, but like I would lurk too if I was a parent. So whatever. Um, that was a harder situation because like, you don't do that in our culture. I think, the best way to describe Persian culture for me, at least my experience of it, was that it is very private. Your personal life is very private. So even if I was dating a dude, like you don't show that kind of affection off. And also just being gay is like not cool in Iran. It's just not. It's really, really scary. So my dad finding that out was uh, awkward for me and and concerning. But um yeah, then I told some friends at school, they found out everyone was everyone at school was pretty cool because I hung out with a bunch of like outcasty misfits anyways. So we were all like either artsy weird kids or like we all had crazy hair and m- my best friend was this gay guy. So it, that was chill. There were definitely some weird bullies who called me a dyke when I was walking around and, you know, mess with me, but that's annoying. I don't know. The the coming out experience wasn't just like this one moment. And I think that's a misconception a lot of people have. It's not just one moment. It's every time you meet somebody. I'm still coming out all the time. Like, I feel like I'm coming out right now because there's probably internet strangers who have no idea who I am being like, oh, she's gay. So it's always a process. It's always a little scary. I'm not going to lie because you don't know how someone's going to react. I'm totally comfortable in my skin, but I don't know what to expect with strangers. And I still get scary, messed up homophobic messages on Instagram and the internet all the time. So it's a really long winded winded question, but, um, I guess you get the idea. It's, it's hard and then it's easy in ways and then it's confusing. And I think the most interesting thing for me though, was how different my experience with my mom and my dad were. My mom's American and much more, um, understanding and supportive of those unique qualities and what makes somebody different. So she was really just like, she wanted me to be happy and she wanted me to find love and to be safe and healthy. So she was concerned. She definitely was like, you should talk to a therapist just to, you know, explore your feelings, which I get. Um, My dad, it's taken a long time, but he's now just like, you know, chill and hangs out with my girlfriend. And I never thought I would have that. I never thought I would have that, but it's taken a lot of patience with him and it's given me so much faith because people can grow, people can change, people can learn and evolve. And that's not always the case with everybody, but I'm really grateful that the people that matter most in my life love me for me, and just want me to be happy. And I guess advice I would give to anyone who's got conservative parents or comes from a part of the world where it's not okay to be yourself, my advice would be to, number one, be safe. Coming out looks different to everybody. You don't need to scream it from the rooftops. If it's not safe, if that doesn't feel comfortable for you, don't worry about it. Just make sure that you feel comfortable in your skin and your body and your identity, that's the most important. But if you do want to share who you are with a family or loved ones, friends, whatever, I think something really important that I wish I knew was how helpful compassion and patience is and to really treat those people with the same compassion and care you expect them to treat you with. Because when you are from a certain background, you have concerns over it and you just want your family to be okay. And you might take a while to kind of restructure your belief system and restructure how you see and think of people. And I think if I understood that patience sooner and kind of approached my situation with my family a bit differently in more of a like sharing and learning and making sure they were comfortable and reassuring their concerns, whatever I had to do, 
instead of being like, this is me, you need to accept me or else you're going to lose me from your life. Like I would do that dramatic scream crying stuff. And it didn't work. It didn't work because everybody has their beliefs and, you know, we just have to tailor our approach to each person differently. And sometimes that means taking our time, disarming them, you know, speaking to their concerns, really sharing like, hey, I'm not trying to do anything crazy. I just want to be me. I just want a chance to be who I am and live a fulfilling life. All right, this next one's interesting because um, it's about relationships. So whoever sent this in wanted to know how do I deal with people being interested in or invested in my relationships? And I really had to learn the hard way to really keep things private that I hold dear to me. So I think there's a difference between being secretive and hiding something versus being private. Like I have a girlfriend now who we live together. We've been together almost two years now. And I just love her so much. And I love our relationship. It's the healthiest, best relationship I've ever been in. And I've seen firsthand how dangerous and uh, messed up it can be when people are invested in your relationship. It's like it puts all this pressure on you to be this perfect kind of like public facing couple all the time. And, and it doesn't allow you to be human. Like relationships are hard sometimes. Sometimes you are so annoyed with each other or sometimes you're just not in the mood to be all like cute and fun and playful. Sometimes you just want to be chill and like not have to think about how you're going to share your love with each other for other people. Like that's really weird to me. And I feel like the more invested people get in your relationship, the more harm it does, the more energy is kind of being projected at you. And like, I want to keep this shit safe. So I really am aware of how much I share and how I share it because I'm not trying to have things crumble because a bunch of strangers that follow me are looking at my relationship as entertainment because it's not. It's my life. It's my loved one's lives. It's my future. It's my family. Like, That's something that you have to really be aware of and protect, just like you'd protect anything you care about. So I think there's some benefits to sharing parts of yourself and sharing your relationship, especially when you have like a non-conventional relationship, because that representation is so important. But that also means people get mega invested, like they're in it, they're standing you, they're shipping you, they're just like following your every move. And it's like the second you don't comment on a picture or post them that day. It's like, oh my God, something's wrong. And then they start going in on like what happened. And I just don't need that energy. Like this is mine. This is something I love and just, I want to keep it safe. So I think finding that balance has been interesting for me and I just think it's so important to do. So yeah. So I got a lot of questions about um, rumors of somebody I've dated in my past, which duh. Um, if you know, you know, but I got a lot of questions about how I went from romantic relationships with certain people to platonic friendships. And I'm a big fan of being friends with my exes and people I've dated, um, as long as they're not toxic or harmful, like I'm not friends with everyone I've dated, but I feel like certain people come into our lives and if we connect with them, we share something with them, we have some kind of vulnerability or an energy exchange of any sort, I feel like we're meant to have those people in our lives for a certain reason. And sometimes we think that connection means that we're supposed to be romantic partners. And sometimes that doesn't work out because you're meant to be friends. And that's totally okay. I I really am not and never have been somebody who's like, oh, we broke up, cut them out of my lives, they don't exist. I think that's fucking weird. And I think that is really like not a... I think it's just not healthy to do that. Unless that person is toxic, yes, cut them out. But I just, if I love somebody, if I really connected with somebody, it doesn't matter if it was romantic or platonic at the time. I'm not going to just throw that away because our dating life didn't work out. Like, nah, we're friends now. Like, this is it. So we're going to evolve. And I think something that I've learned because I am friends with so many people I've dated in the past is you do need a like cool off period. 
after you end the romantic relationship and the romantic connection, you need a cool off period to kind of reset the energy, reset the vibes. And then moving forward, you can hang out as friends and kind of ease into that and really have that new type of dynamic blossom. And if anyone needs advice on how to do that, because I've gotten some questions about that too, boundaries are important. Um, It's easy to slip into old roles and old dynamics with people, especially when you have a strong connection. So having those boundaries of like not letting certain things happen and not being weird, like just don't be weird. If you're going to be friends, be friends. Like that means sharing stuff about who you're dating now or, you know, past old feelings that were hurtful. Or if somebody's acting weird, you call them out on that. Like it doesn't need to be this like we're dating, but like a different version of it like be friends or date. I don't like the in-between. I think that's weird and messy. Um, But yeah, I treat everybody that is my friend in my life, whether we dated or not, with respect, with love. And um, yeah, next question is, how do you deal with being queer and Iranian? There's a huge lack of LGBTQ Persian role models. Yes, I agree. Um, I really think if I had those role models, not even just Persian, but like if I just had more people that I could identify with growing up, probably would have saved myself a lot of drama um, and figured out who I was a lot sooner. So I think having role models that you identify with is so important. And if any of you are Iranian, Persian, whatever, Muslim, um, come from the Middle East in any sort of way, like I'm happy to be here for you. If this helps you, I'm so, so glad. Um, but I don't know how I deal with it. I guess it's really been interesting for me because my parents divorced when I was really young. So I kind of lived this double life where my mom was American, very, um, very progressive and open and accepting and, you know, do your thing and just live life, go with the flow. Like that was my mom's side. And then my dad's side was very like, I don't know, Persian, very conservative, very Middle Eastern, There's a lot of things you don't share. You kind of follow these set rules. There's very rigid standards that you're expected to meet when it comes to your identity, when it comes to how you live your life in any way, like your job, what you study in school, how you perform your gender, the relationships you have, like there, you know, like you have to learn to cook so that you can get a husband. Like those things are very prevalent in that community. And there's also incredible, beautiful things about that culture, which I'm so obsessed with. I'm a Persian culture is stunning and so rich. So I, it's really interesting having those, um, those two sides of like the really beautiful, gorgeous, expansive, diverse parts, and then the really like limited confining parts. But, um, yeah, when I'm in those spaces, it's very I'm very aware of myself and I don't feel as free to be myself at ease, which sucks. Um, but I I think it just really makes me more aware of myself and I hope someday I don't need to be that way, but I'm I definitely catch myself presenting more feminine when I go to Persian spaces and how I am with my partner in front of my Persian family. I'm not as like handholdy and like cuddly and affectionate, which I catch myself doing that. And I think I'm just not comfortable to to be as open in that way because I'm like, I'm thinking of how people are viewing it and I don't want to make people uncomfortable. And I want them to feel like, oh, this is a normal relationship. You know what I mean? So, so I have a pretty complicated relationship with that and I'm realizing it right now. But I think it's been interesting for me to to navigate how I exist in spaces that are not as accepting of my identity and who I am. And I have my ways of, I guess, I guess it's just masking in general. I'm trying to make my identity and who I am comfortable and more palatable for people, which we shouldn't have to do. And it really bums me out that that's a thing. But that's definitely a real thing for so many people and being able to experience having to do that with also being able to be this like really loud, outspoken dyke. Like it's so weird that I'm, I kind of shift and um, like it's just code switching, I guess. But I still want to make sure that I'm representing myself and my identity accurately and authentically, 
but also doing it, I guess, in a dimmed down way. So I'm not making anyone be like, oh my God, oh, these crazy gay people. Like, I don't want to do that. I want to slowly normalize and like ease people into it who may have a harder time because I notice when you do things in a more aggressive way of like, this is me, I'm loud and I'm proud and I'm in your face. That makes people's defenses go up, makes them uncomfortable and it makes them more apt to like not be open to something. And that's the last thing I want. I want people of my culture. I want people who are more conservative to be like, oh, okay, this is, this is cool. Like y'all are normal. This is fine. Like you're not being weird. You're not being too intense. You're not being too whatever. And then slowly I can, you know, let my guard down a bit more and be more myself. So I really hope that with time, the Middle Eastern communities in general, obviously Persian community, but the Middle East and Muslim countries and Muslim cultures, Muslim, I can't say that, Muslim cultures can be safer spaces for queer people and uh, safer spaces for gender non-conforming people and non-binary people and trans people, I I just really hope that doing this sort of gentle dance of slowly unfolding the layers of who I am will help those people to be more accepting and open and learn. And yeah, I feel like I'm rambling, but yeah, uh, I just think it's, it's about normalizing it and I'm fine to move slowly and strategically to normalize things in my culture versus just being like, screw you, I'm going to be myself and you can't accept that, fuck off. Like that's not productive to me and that doesn't help people change or learn. So I'll take my time, even if that means I have to be a little bit uncomfortable and hyper aware of myself at some moments. Last question. What would you tell your younger self? The classic question that I feel like every interview asks, but it always changes. I feel like the more I grow and learn and experience life, the more I'm like, ooh, I should have told baby me that. Like, I wish she knew that. So I feel like my answer for that would be to stop trying to fit in because I tried so damn hard for so long to just be like everyone else because I thought that would make me accepted. I thought that would bring me value and love and fulfill me. But all I was doing was searching for external validation I was looking for other people to tell me I was worthy and that I was amazing and perfect and beautiful and fulfilled and, you know, just worthy of good things and had value. I was, I was looking for that from the outside when I should have been just looking for it internally. And I wasted so much time doing that. And at the end of the day, like when you're trying to fit in, people can tell, people can tell when you're trying to be something that you're not, or trying to be someone you're not. And so I had a lot of trouble making friends. I had a lot of trouble fitting in. And so it just kind of reinforced this I'm not good enough idea that I had, that I'm not worthy of you know acceptance. I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy of fitting in. Like I just had this thing running through my head and that ends up being a self-fulfilling prophecy because you're doing weird shit to try and fit in with people who are like, why is she doing weird shit? Why doesn't she just be herself? So- I don't know how else to hammer that home. If you're trying to be somebody other than who you are, whether that's even dressing in a way that doesn't feel comfortable to you or just trying to fit in some box that isn't right, like don't waste your fucking time anymore. It's so pointless. And that's different from adjusting who you are to be safe. If you are in a space where you need to kind of mask parts of yourself and your identity to be safe, um, do that. I get it. And I think anyone who tells you that you have to just, you know, bear your soul has never experienced hardship like that and doesn't know what it's like to be unsafe. And I think it's a privilege to be able to be yourself without any guard up, but trying to be somebody that you're not will ultimately harm you in the long run. And it'll make it a lot harder to connect with people, to make friends, to find people to love and It's just a fucking waste of time. So I wish I would have told little me that and I wish she would have really understood it properly because what kid is going to actually get that and be like, yeah, okay, I'll just be myself. But for real, like, I think 
that is so important to just be yourself. It's such a simple concept. It's so hard to actually do. And it's something I still have to remind myself of all the time. I'm very much myself in many ways, but sometimes I have to just remember what that means and remember who I am and reflect on who I am and make sure that everything in my life aligns with who I am now. So yeah, be yourself. That's it. Moral of the story. And I guess this comes full circle now because the whole point of this series, podcast, whatever you want to call it, is to make it easier to be yourself and to make you feel empowered to be yourself and comfortable to be yourself and know you're not alone. Even if the city or space or family you're in makes you feel alone, you're not alone. There's so many people out there who are down with people like you and are like you in some way or are accepting of types of people that you are and want people like you to win and want people like you to thrive and be fulfilled. And this is a space that is all about that. So I hope you stick around and come back and see what else we have to offer and connect with other people in the community because um, there's a lot of cool people who are kind of building in this like little she, her, they network. And I'm so happy to see it buzzing and blossoming. And I feel like I'm sounding really corny now, but um, yeah, this makes me really happy. And I'm, ew, I'm getting emotional. Um, so that's that. I'm going to wrap this up and maybe I'll uh, answer some more questions later on. But for now, thank you. Thank you for watching this because it's probably long. And um, thank you for tuning in. And just a reminder to subscribe so you can see future things that are here. And also if you like audio, all the podcast platforms, um, you can listen to this there. And what else? Oh yeah, follow us on Instagram. It's at she, her, they. We also have a Discord if you want to make some friends. There's a bunch of people that are just so cool and fun and chatting in there. It's really nice. And I hop in there all the time just to like ramble with people. And yeah, I guess that's it. So see you next time. How do people close out their episodes of channels? I don't know. I feel like I can't stop talking. I feel like I'm like waiting for someone else to hang up the phone, but like there's no one else. I have to hang up the phone. So there's not even a phone. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, this is it. Okay, bye. <laughs>